It is the most legendary war in history. A thousand ships to be launched for the sake of one woman. It begins with a beauty contest. Warriors, chariots, and horses. And ends with a giant horse unleashing destruction and annihilation. Whole walls fell over. A tale so powerful, it inspires 3,000 years of myth and legend. He was willing to sacrifice his own daughter. It is a story of armies divided. Deception, deceit. Stolen treasures. The decline, the catastrophe. An ancient world trade center. There were always enemies enough who wanted to have that place. And a war without end. It was a conflict between East and West. Now, archaeologists, literary detectives, and military analysts are uncovering evidence that the mythological city, destroyed by beauty and vengeance, may be real. This is the true story of Troy. This is the cradle of Western civilization. Mainland Greece on the west and Asia Minor on the east and dozens of islands in between. The Aegean Sea links the inhabitants of this region, seafaring adventurers and their legends of gods and heroes. For thousands of years, fortune seekers and archeologists have been searching these shores for evidence of the Trojan War. And now, some say they have found it. Today, not far off the pristine coast of the Aegean Sea, in what is now the modern country of Turkey, an international team is excavating what they believe to be the site of legendary Troy. They claim they're finding evidence of a five-acre city, complete with palace, streets, and a vibrant downtown. Outside the walls, they say they have evidence of a lower city. Ancient suburbs surrounded by a defensive moat built to prevent attacks by chariots, the ancient world's weapon of mass destruction. Manfred Korfman has been the director of the excavation since 1988. If you look around in this area, you see nothing. It's old fields, it's surface, but there was something in here. Here on this barren plain, Korfman and his colleagues envision a fortified city that rivals ancient Athens. Dating to the late Bronze Age, the prehistoric time of the Trojan War. But, as in all things Trojan, there is a conflict raging. Some think Korfman's finds are pure fantasy as credible as the myth itself. Is this the site of ancient Troy? Did Troy actually exist? Why does its memory echo through time? I think the Trojan War is the original source of so many of our cultural expectations of soldiers, of literature, of human behavior, of the interplay between the divine and the mundane. So much of our cultural tradition originates in the Trojan War uh, that we continue to value it, even unconsciously, as a source of the archetypes upon which we model our behavior. History became a story, and story became myth, and myth is always elusive. So now we're trying, in a very strange way, to go trace our steps backwards, which is not that easy. I mean, it's one thing to dress a history and make it story and then myth, and another thing to undress it. It takes much more pain and it's more dangerous. Although today some scholars have reservations about the existence of Troy, historians of the ancient world never doubted the Trojan War was history. 
Herodotus, Thucydides, and most other major figures of the Greek and Roman world assumed that the Trojan War was a historical fact. Here, on a beach not unlike that of Troy, classics professor Robert Garland recounts the tale. Well, it all began with the gods, as things of great moment tended to in the ancient world, and it began with the wedding, wedding of Peleus and Thetis, destined incidentally to be the parents of Achilles, the greatest of the Greek warriors at Troy. And they invited all the celebrities of the ancient world, all the gods, all the goddesses, except one. They didn't think it was a very good idea to invite discord. Discord shows up anyway. She offers a golden apple inscribed with the words, for the fairest. Three goddesses, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, claim the apple and ask Zeus to be the judge. He wisely declines and instead appoints Paris, the handsome prince of Troy. And as often happens, each of the contestants offered a bribe. The one he gave the prize to, Aphrodite, offered him the bribe of the most beautiful woman in the world. But there was one problem. That woman was married. She was Helen, married to Menelaus, king of Sparta. Paris sails for Sparta under the guise of official Trojan business. When Menelaus, his host, was absent, he eloped with Helen back to Troy and thus unleashed the fury that would become the Trojan War. Menelaus appealed to his brother Agamemnon, who was the overlord of the Greeks at that time. And Agamemnon summoned together all the Greek cities, all the kings, for a war of revenge to right the wrong that had been done to his brother. A thousand ships assemble, but the gods cause the winds to cease. To appease the gods, Agamemnon must make the ultimate sacrifice, the ritual slaying of his own daughter. The winds blow, the fleet sails, and the war begins. The Greeks encamp around the walls of Troy, and for the next 10 long years, Heroes are made and destroyed on the battlefield. Achilles, the celebrated Greek warrior, and Hector, the Trojan champion. As the war began to drag on in the 10th year, and it looked as if there was no end in sight, so the Greeks devised the ruse of the Trojan horse. The Greeks sailed off, and the Trojan horse was left outside the walls. The Trojans broke their walls down to let the horse enter, stuffed full as it was with Greek soldiers. And in the night, as the Trojans were celebrating, down came the Greeks out of the wooden horse, let in their companions, and proceeded to rape, pillage, and destroy. Many acts of vandalism were committed in that time, Priam was slaughtered at his own altar. Cassandra was raped. And the infant son of Hector was thrown from the walls of Troy, his brains dashed out. And even then, after Troy had been totally destroyed, the end was not in sight. As we know from the Odyssey, Odysseus was to wander for many years before he got home. Agamemnon returned to domestic turmoil. His wife, Clytemnestra, had been having an affair with her lover and with him plotted the death of Agamemnon. So the homecoming of the Greeks was for them as devastating as was the destruction of Troy. How can such a fantastic story be true? The legend of Troy comes to us first from the oldest writings in Western civilization, the Iliad and the Odyssey, their authorship credited to the poet Homer. But Homer isn't born until five centuries after the war is thought to have occurred, and he is believed to have been blind and illiterate. 
Homer is our earliest witness for the Trojan War. And yet, the Trojan War took place perhaps as many as 500 years before Homer's date. So how reliable can he possibly be? How can we trust this blind man's tale of lust and infidelity? Human sacrifice, rape, blood, war, destruction, and the ultimate deceit. Is Homer's story the true story of Troy? It's the most legendary war in history. The first great story of Western civilization. For years, scholars believed it was only myth. But now, off the coast of the Aegean Sea, archaeologists claim to have discovered the remains of the ancient fortress city, Troy. Is Troy and the Trojan War history or myth? How can our best witness, a blind, illiterate poet named Homer, be trusted? This is the true story of Troy. Like Troy, what is known of Homer is a mixture of history and myth. Although he is credited as the author of Western civilization's first works of literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey, very little evidence of Homer exists. Some scholars estimate that he lived around 750 BC, and that the father of Greek literature was from a place not far from Troy. We think that he came from a region probably fairly close to Troy, perhaps from the city of Smyrna or from the island of Chios. But even this is doubtful. There's a strong tradition that he was blind, but other than that, virtually nothing can be said with any certainty about him. Two of the greatest mysteries about Homer concern how someone who lived 500 years after the Trojan War can recall such graphic details of battle and bloodshed. And how could one person, before the invention of Greek writing, remember more than 16,000 lines from the Iliad and 12,000 lines from the Odyssey? One possible answer is that Homer is a descendant of a lineage of singer-storytellers. If this is true, it means that the Iliad and Odyssey were not written by a Homer, but were passed down by many Homers. It's perfectly possible that singers immediately began to sing about this famous conflict, that it was passed on from one generation to the next, uh, not, not, not with any attention to historical accuracy, in which no one had any interest. All the details and all the fancy stuff and the, and the woman running away and Achilles and Hector and the, and, the, and the Trojan horse, all this stuff was generated by singers over the ages. Their contributions to the story were inherited by Homer and he added his own twist to it. But if Homer is the last in a lineage of oral poets, how does the story of Troy transform from a memorized song to the first written story of Western civilization. In the 1930s, an American scholar by the name of Milman Parry, equipped with some of the first portable sound recording devices, discovers a way to return to a time when all of history was a song. Parry treks to old world Balkan villages in Serbia and discovers singers who, just like Homer, sing epic songs of ancient battles and heroes. Perry made recordings on aluminum discs and on aluminum wire uh, of these songs, and he also took down these songs by dictation. Perry discovered a very interesting thing, that when you write down uh, an oral poem, it tends to get much longer than when you just sing it in a public performance. For over a year, Perry investigates the oral tradition, transcribing and recording many songs, some as long as Homer's. Parry finds that memory of historical events can be passed on for long periods of time and still remain accurate. The Serbian bards sing about the Battle of Kosovo, which had taken place in the 14th century. Amazingly, written accounts of heroes battling invaders confirm these 600-year-old songs to be true. 
Is it possible, therefore, that there really was a Trojan War and that at least the fact of the war was passed down through oral tradition for 400 years or so in, until 800 BC when Homer's poems are finally taken down? My own opinion is, is, is that this is plausible. That, 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 that there must, in fact, have been a Trojan War. Uh, otherwise, why would anybody have sung about it in the first place? Parry's work confirms that one person can not only memorize songs as long as the Iliad and Odyssey, but that the accounts can be historically true. For the first time, there is an understanding of how the story of Troy could survive 500 years until the time of Homer, and how Homer's greatness is born. Homer must have been a very famous singer in his day. He must have been like the Rolling Stones. He was a very famous entertainer of some kind. It's plausible that his greatness as a poet, which is proven by his the Iliad and the Odyssey, by his, his brilliant poems that have survived, did inspire somebody to record these stories. Indeed, the very man who invented the technological means that made the recording possible, that is, the Greek alphabet. Before Homer, epic stories were memorized and sung. These oral tales were usually performed at the feasts of aristocrats and noblemen. But Homer's story of Troy was so powerful that someone wanted a way to record the words and teach them to others. The problem was the Greeks had no system of writing. So one theory is that this someone, the first Greek scribe, adapts the Phoenician writing system, adds vowels, and invents the Greek alphabet to record the words of Homer. Here's an example based upon uh, early epigraphic remains of what this uh, text might have looked like. It begins on the right-hand side. Uh, back and forth, uh, as the ox turns, the Greek said comparing this style of writing to the plowing of a field where you plow up one end and back the other and then back again. Now, with Homer singing to a scribe, these heroic stories of Troy, the first in Greek history to be written down, inspire a much greater audience. In my opinion, is because they were the first texts that ever existed in the Greek vocal alphabet. And as such, they were used from the very beginning as, as the basis for instruction about how to use this writing system. And they never stopped being that. So when you went to school in ancient Greece, you studied the text of Homer, right back to the day that the man who invented the alphabet first wrote them down. Homer's story of Troy becomes the tool by which language and literature are taught, the very foundation of Western civilization. For the next 3,000 years, his story of Troy will inspire the greatest Greek and Roman writers, Renaissance artists, Shakespeare, and even Hollywood films. But over the centuries, the true story of Troy is blurred by myth, and Troy the city, a ruin even at the time of Homer, is covered by the sands of time and lost. Then, in the 19th century, inspired by Homer's account of battle, blood, lust, and deceit, a rich adventurer goes in search of the treasures and the true story of Troy. It is a Bronze Age clash of cultures a battle over the most beautiful woman in the world. This tale of heroes, blood, lust, and deceit from a time before writing is sung for hundreds of years. Then the greatest of Greek singers, Homer, sings of Troy so powerfully, he inspires the invention of the Greek alphabet. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are the first written works of ancient Greece and become the foundation of Western civilization. But over time, the story of Troy is obscured by myth, and the city is lost. Now, can Homer's Iliad and Odyssey lead explorers to the treasures of this legendary city and rediscover the true story of Troy? July 6th, 1827. 
After centuries of Ottoman occupation, Greece wins its independence and emerges as a new nation. Europe is smitten with everything Greek, and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey ignite Trojan fever. With a pick in one hand and the Iliad in the other, a German-American self-made millionaire, Heinrich Schliemann, sets off to uncover Troy. Heinrich Schliemann is actually a fascinating man. He's a Wall Street tycoon of the 19th century. He made a great deal of money speculating in Russia and in the United States, including the gold rush in California. Having made a great deal of money and therefore being able to retire from his business pursuits, he at this point can go and pursue what he claimed was a lifelong fixation with Greece and particularly with the Trojan War. Heinrich Schliemann has a knack for finding gold. He is in California for the gold rush, makes millions in St. Petersburg under the czars. And in his search for profit and adventure, he dresses as a Bedouin, circumcises himself, and sneaks into Mecca. In 1868, he moves to Athens and launches a campaign throughout the Aegean in search of the legends of Homer and ultimately Troy. Schliemann was not an archaeologist, but he had a sacred faith in Homer. I mean, Homer was his Bible. And uh, this led him to discover things which nobody else had thought of discovering, of looking for, let's say. Schliemann sets out to look for a place that matches the landscape described by Homer in the Iliad. A vast plain where two great armies can battle, near the Aegean Sea, between the Scamander and Simois rivers. a place with high fortified walls from which the Trojans could watch in horror as their champion Hector is dragged behind the chariot of Achilles around the city. Elizabeth Reardon, architect for the excavations currently underway at Troy, retraces Schliemann's steps on the plains of modern Turkey. Heinrich Schliemann was convinced that Homer was writing about a place that actually existed. And he was also convinced that this place here, known as Hisarlik, was where he was going to find Troy. He thought that if he excavated all the way down to bedrock, whatever it was he found at the bottom had to be the Troy that Homer had written about. In 1870, Schliemann and his hundreds of workers plow through thousands of years of civilization cutting trenches in the mound running north to south and east to west. The Trojan plain becomes littered with Schliemann's piles of what he considered rubble. He digs for years, but finds no evidence of Homer's Troy. He's getting desperate. What he really needed was a big, splashy find. The man was very lucky because at the end of his third year of excavating, he made a find that that fit that bill. He was investigating this very large fortification wall when they uncovered in a small pocket a treasure trove of gold objects. This was exactly the kind of find that he needed to get to get attention. Golden cups and goblets, highly polished stones and precious jewels. In 1873, Schliemann smuggles the treasure out of Turkey, dresses his wife in the jewels like Helen of Troy, and with Barnum-like showmanship, claims he has uncovered King Priam's treasure. He dazzles the world with headlines. Heinrich Schliemann discovers legendary Troy. But the showman's headlines prove false. The treasure Schliemann finds dates to 2,500 years earlier than Priam and does not correspond to the time of the Trojan War. And worse, Schliemann may have stolen his discovery of Homer's Troy. Schliemann, with his interest in Homer, was not the first in this area. Frank Calvert, 
a British expatriate, had been living in the area from 1845 onward. He grew up in this area and gradually amassed a tremendous amount of textual evidence for where Troy lay. When Schliemann arrives in Turkey, there are several sites thought to be Homer's Troy. But Frank Calvert is convinced that the land he owns, a mound named Hisarlik, is Ilium, an ancient Greco-Roman city from which Homer titles his Iliad. Schliemann seeks out Frank Calvert. When Schliemann came to the Calvert house in August 1868, Calvert's house was full of artifacts and works of art that Calvert had excavated from Hisarlik, from Troy. Now, when they had dinner, Calvert told Schliemann all about his excavations, showed him what he had found, and Schliemann was clearly very impressed. Schliemann goes back to Athens, and without ever setting foot on the site, writes his first book on Troy. The problem is, he doesn't know the details. Calvert wrote Schliemann answers to Schliemann's many questions, one of which was, how high was the mound? Was it 20 meters or 100 meters high? The very fact that Schliemann would ask this question shows that he had absolutely no concept of the site itself. Though Calvert has been quietly digging by himself for years, Schliemann pours his vast wealth into a grand excavation with hundreds of workers and is anything but quiet. Schliemann tells the world that he is the sole discoverer of Troy and literally leaves Frank Calvert in the dust. Despite false claims of Priam's treasure and accusations of stealing the site of Troy from Frank Calvert, Heinrich Schliemann convinces the world that Hisarlik is the site of Homer's Troy and that the Trojan War is real. Schliemann was somebody who dedicated his life, his fortune, and his activities to proving Homer true. And this has my respect. It's largely because of Schliemann that we're asking the question, was this war real? Today, we still follow in that tradition in asking questions about the Trojan War. But even Heinrich Schliemann, perhaps the most devout believer in the Iliad as history, can't produce definitive proof of Homer's Troy. Somewhere in these ruins is the promise of finding some scrap of writing, some Trojan treasure to prove beyond doubt that the Trojan War and the story of Troy are real. It is the most legendary war in history, fought around 1250 BC in the prehistoric Bronze Age. The tale of lust and battle is sung for 500 years until Homer's story of Troy, the Iliad, inspires the invention of the Greek alphabet. Over the next 2,000 years, the legendary city is lost until in the 1870s, Heinrich Schliemann, with pick in one hand and Iliad in the other, claims to discover the site of the Trojan War. But his showmanship and unscrupulous ways cast doubt on his claims. And worse, his excavations destroy so much of the site that it is condemned as an unreliable witness in the search for the true story of Troy. How could this rock heap in present-day Turkey be Homer's Troy? Even Schliemann expressed doubts. It is all poetry, he says. Troy is a myth, and the site of Hisarlik is only a hill. In essence, he says in various writings, well, I'm very pleased at what I've done, I've discovered Troy, and so on and so forth, but I'm a little disappointed because based on what Homer says, his description of Troy, I would have thought that Troy would have been bigger. 
Where is the proof that his sarlik is big enough to be Homer's Troy? After Schliemann's death in 1890, his wife Sophie and dig director Wilhelm Dorpfeld identify the different levels of the mound at Hisarlik and number the layers according to years. They discover that Schliemann dug too far, that Priam's treasure comes from about 2500 BC or level two. The Trojan War is thought to have taken place at level six or seven, about 1250 BC. And at that layer, they find evidence of cataclysmic destruction. Is this evidence for a real Trojan War? In 1932, one of the most revered figures in archaeology, Carl Blagan of the University of Cincinnati, arrives on the scene. Blagan, having excavated in the mainland, felt that this was the time to go back to Troy to try and place Troy in the context of the larger Greek Bronze Age world. Blagan re-examines the entire site, discovers that Troy is at its height at level six. At the layer above, level seven, he discovers a concentration of houses within the walled city that seem to indicate the population is seeking protection against a siege. But not even Blagan discovers a city as large as that described by Homer. Troy seems destined to remain a mystery. Then, in 1982, Manfred Korfman comes to Troy. There's much skepticism in the archaeological world about his going back to Troy. Many people thought that it had already been excavated after all the three campaigns there, that there wouldn't be much more to discover. But Korfman's campaign introduces 50 years of new technology to the excavation. One of his first discoveries is just south of Troy, along the Aegean. Here, his team finds over 50 cremations and burials containing Mycenaean Greek grave goods. Could this be evidence of the Greek camp and remains of Greek warriors who came to fight against Troy? Korfman's team also discovers that the Bay of Troy is quite different from today. In fact, the water at the time of the Trojan War would have been closer to within sight of the walls of Troy. And in recent years, not far from the ancient bay, using magnetic prospecting equipment, Korfman and his team find what at first looks like a wall about a quarter of a mile outside the citadel of Troy. But what he actually finds is the opposite of a wall. Here, we do have a picture like X-ray looking into the ground and finding remains of what may have been ditches. The ditch that Korfman unearths is cut deep into the bedrock, leading him to believe that its purpose is most likely defensive. The archaeologists were able to verify a Troy 6 date for the date when this um, ditch had been uh, constructed. Troy 6 represents the time of the Trojan War. And there are many similarities between this defensive ditch and one Homer describes in the Iliad. If you look at his description of the fortification ditch that's dug around the Greek camp, and then you look at the fortification ditch that we found, certainly that's a striking similarity between the two. It's actually quite likely that this is the site that Homer had in mind when he put down the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Over the years, Korfman and his team discover religious totems for worship of Trojan gods, spindle whorls for weaving the fine fabrics traded by Troy through the ancient world, enemy spear tips and arrowheads embedded in the walls of Troy coins from the time of Alexander the Great, and a bust of Roman Emperor Augustus, who traces his lineage back to Troy. But despite the incredible finds, 
one find continues to elude Korfman, just as it had everyone back to Schliemann. Where is evidence of the huge city described by Homer? One of the more important things we want to know about Troy is how large the settlement was in different points in time at different periods, and how it grew, how it shrank, and if there were different activities going on in different areas or parts of the settlement. We can't answer this by excavation alone. To discover the elusive vastness of the city described by Homer, Korfman's team employs a technique that more resembles farming than archaeology. It's called site survey. Every 20 meters, we remove the vegetation to get conditions similar to a freshly plowed field. We collect everything we find there. Pottery, tile fragments, whatever is lying around. Just get an idea about settlement size and function of different areas. They bring their finds back to camp, where artifacts are washed, classified, and dated. It's a lot of broken pots representing thousands of years. This year we covered about 15 hectares, about 400 points, and we collected more than 100,000 items from there, about two tons of material. A significant quantity of the pottery shards are from the Bronze Age, particularly the time just before the Trojan War. We can see how the area all the way to this, to this ditch and, and in the east and where this ditch was covered by a Bronze Age settlement. Pieces of the Trojan War Age pottery extend over a quarter of a mile out from the walled city of Troy all the way to the defensive ditch. This ditch, described by Homer as built by the Greeks to defend their ships, is more likely a ditch built by Trojans to defend Troy against the Greeks. Korfman is confident that this area, from the ditch to the fortified walls of the citadel, is a vast lower city, more than five acres that along with the temples and palaces of the citadel, comprise the glorious city that is Troy. It is a Troy large enough to match Homer's and rich enough for the Greeks to want to conquer. We archeologists have in Troya the proof and the hints that this place always was fortified again and again. It was always rich enough to defend itself. There were always enemies enough who wanted to have that place. For us, this is enough argument to say that there always had been war at this wars at this place. It seems clear that nearly 3,000 years after Homer, Manfred Korfman has finally proved that Troy is real. But now, where is the evidence of the Trojan War? What was it really fought over? Are we to believe Homer's claim that a woman, even the most beautiful woman in the world, could cause the destruction of Troy? It is a Bronze Age clash of civilizations, fought around 1250 BC. Then, 500 years later, the Greek poet Homer sings his epic story of Troy becomes a superstar and inspires the invention of the Greek alphabet. Over time, Troy is lost and its story is obscured by myth and legend. Until the 1800s, when Homer's Iliad inspires the search for this legendary city. Today, archeologists are uncovering evidence suggesting they have discovered the site of Troy. But how can the theft of Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world, launch a thousand ships in a fight for love and glory? 
Is this the true story of Troy? To the ancient Greeks, beauty is order. It is exemplified in the naked body. Youthful and round, with tapered waist, high conical breasts, and curvaceous thighs. Surely Helen was all this. And her theft, an attack on world order, an act of war against the Greeks. But her abduction is also a personal affront against a very powerful ruler. The legend of Helen being abducted and from that the war flowed uh, is not impossible, but it's unlikely as a sole cause. Brigadier General John Brown of the U.S. Army is an expert on ancient warfare. What's more likely is that there was a opportunity waiting to happen, a war that was uh, a, a, a awaiting a cause. There was a instinct for expansion on the part of the Mycenaeans that provided an underpinning that needed a triggering event. Helen being abducted would very readily have been a kind of a triggering event that could have galvanized the warriors of such an age into a uh, effort to redeem their reputation and uh, increase their glory. Homer tells us of a coalition of Mycenaean Greeks under the leadership of Agamemnon, crossing the Aegean in a thousand ships to make war on Troy sometime around 1250 BC. How does Homer's account stack up against modern military strategy? A quarrel over women who were stolen. Acting as military chief of staff to Agamemnon, General Brown assembles his staff. Troy is a heavily fortified Intelligence. Stay clear of this Operations. Brought it within the walls. Logistics. Defenses. Personnel. They gather to make war on the enemy, the Trojans. Gentlemen, we've been asked to do an operational analysis of the Trojan War to try to come to grips with the campaign imperatives that affected both the Mycenaeans, or Greeks, uh, and the Trojans in the course of the The first order of business is what's at stake. The control of the seaborne trade route critical to the commercial economy of the ancient world. The strategic setting is dominated by the necessity of controlling trade routes. One I'd like to call your attention to in particular, and the one that affects our story, is the one running from the Black Sea through the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara, and out the Dardanelles. That's precisely the location of Troy. Troy's location gives it control of the trade route from east to west, access not only to the breadbasket of Western Asia, but also treasures of gold, spices, and luxury goods. A shipwreck discovered off the coast of Turkey in 1984, dating from the time of the Trojan War, is testimony to the riches at stake. Treasures from seven civilizations are aboard the ship. Gold medallions from Egypt, urns of oil and spices from the Far East, and oxhide-shaped ingots of tin from Central Asia and copper from Cyprus. In fact, these metals are found in the exact proportions for making bronze. 10 parts copper, one part tin. Bronze is made from tin and copper. When you control uh, your access to those materials, you're controlling the industrial materials of the Bronze Age. Controlling bronze production in the Bronze Age is like controlling oil in the Oil Age. If the Greeks want to become an empire, they'll need to capture Troy. But how? If you turn from that strategic setting uh, to the operational level, they had no choice. Again, Except Brigadier General John Brown and his staff apply modern military planning to the ancient battles of the Trojan War. From a personnel point of view, what would you tell me about the layout if this represents the Mycenaean capability and this area right here, Troy? Troy's population did not compare in uh, military manpower 
to the uh, Greek state allies against it. The Greeks assemble a coalition army to outnumber the Trojans five to one. They'll need that overwhelming force to ensure a quick, decisive victory. And to deliver that force, Homer says the Greeks sailed to Troy on a thousand black-bowed ships. Is there anything we should know from an intelligence point of view? Well, a couple things I'd like to point out, sir. Uh, first, as you know, Troy is a heavily fortified city. It's got a strong and a high wall. If we allow them to get behind that wall, that means we're going to have to lay siege to them. Also, they have a series of potential allies that if we alienate them, could come down on the side of the Trojan. Well, given that intelligence backdrop, uh, what do you think the operation should look like? The Greeks should land directly uh, before Troy and either defeat them on the battlefield in open combat with our overwhelming force or starve them out of their walled city. Overwhelming force delivered directly to the shores of Troy on a thousand ships. The Greeks are poised to recapture Helen, restore their honor, and gain power and wealth by controlling the most important trade route of the Bronze Age. It's a simple enough plan. One last logistical consideration, how to feed a thousand ships full of warriors. What's uh, your thoughts there, uh, logistician? The Trojans would have gathered all the local food and water that was available and pulled it within their, the walls of their defenses uh, for their own use and, and as a means of denying it of, to the use of the Greeks. The Greek army, therefore, would have to go further and further afield to gather those supplies of food and water that they were going to need to subsist on. And the primary risk there is that they would alienate those local populations that heretofore had not been engaged in the conflict but would now be inclined to come in on, on the side of the Trojans. Well, it's an interesting point you make, John, because it looks like the Greeks were divided between what uh, they should do in order to win most easily and what they had to do uh, in order to survive as an army. Uh, they had no choice except to support themselves off the land by foraging and by raiding. And it is precisely the result of one of those raids that starts Homer's Iliad. Agamemnon and Achilles fight over a woman that Achilles captures during a raid. Agamemnon pulls rank and claims Achilles' war prize for himself. Achilles rages, reaches for his sword. Professor of Classics Robert Garland reads from the Iliad. Someday, I swear, a yearning for Achilles will strike Greece's sons and all your armies. But then, Agamemnon, harried as you will be, nothing you do can save you. Not when your hordes of fighters drop and die, cut down by the hands of man-killing Hector. Then you will tear your heart out desperate, raging that you disgraced the best of the Greeks. Achilles withdraws himself and his troops from battle, and the raids the Greeks conduct drive the neighboring population into an alliance with the Trojans. The Greeks lose their advantage of overwhelming force, and the war drags on for 10 long years with no clear victor. I think from the point where Homer begins the Iliad, where there is a quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles, his most important warrior, it's clear that this is not altogether a coalition of the willing that he has brought to Troy. The trouble for this coalition of the unwilling starts 10 years earlier back on mainland Greece, where Agamemnon plots a course of revenge and plunder. There, he will be forced to make the ultimate sacrifice, the ritual murder of his own daughter. Troy, a Bronze Age world trade center. Sung about by Homer, his Iliad and Odyssey become the first literary works of Western civilization. But is the mythological city real? Archaeologists now seem certain they have discovered the legendary lost city. But what evidence do we have of the enemies of Troy? 
the Bronze Age Greeks and Homer's King of Kings, Agamemnon. How does Agamemnon forge a coalition of Greek warlords to wage a war of revenge and plunder? This is the true story of Troy. West of Troy, across the Greek islands dotting the Aegean, lies mainland Greece. Athens, Sparta, Pylos, Olympus, and at their center, the largest and richest of the Bronze Age principalities, Mycenae. Hidden in these ruins is evidence of their wealth and power. Spiros Yakovides is the godfather of Mycenaean archaeology and director of excavations. I have been working here since 58, which means for 40 odd years. Eh? And I have come to love the place. Mycenaean civilization was a time of very active interconnections. People had to come through Mycenae or through the area of Mycenae, wherever they wanted to go. Just the sight of this fortress sends a message of power to friend and foe alike. The city's walls rise 40 feet high and span 25 feet wide. Today, Christophilis Magidis, assistant director of excavations, approaches the main entrance, a 20-ton stone carving called the Lion Gate, which dates to the time of the Trojan War. The main element here is the lion relief on top of the gate uh, in the relieving triangle. Here we have uh, an amalgam of political statements and religious uh, allusions. The column represents the house of the king and the lions, his power and protectors. It is a massive display of the king's divine right to rule. It's a very strong statement for the incomer at the first moment he enters uh, the citadel. Just inside the lion gate, here in 1876, Heinrich Schliemann uncovers one of the richest finds in archaeological history, including a magnificent golden death mask. In his showman-like way, he proclaims, I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. High atop the citadel, archaeologists uncover remains of a palace much like one described by Homer. Inside, they discover a treasure trove of opulent relics and murals, glorifying Mycenaean war and conquest. We have scenes, beautiful scenes, of a besieged city uh, with tall buildings and women looking out of the windows, warriors, chariots and horses. One cannot but think that these scenes reflect, or at least echo in some way, all the adventures of the Mycenaeans in Southwest and Northwest Asia Minor. On the terrace of the palace, overlooking the rich valley and beyond to the Aegean, perhaps dreaming of conquering Troy, kings like Agamemnon would feast with fellow warlords. Homer describes such a feast that takes place across the Peloponnesian Peninsula in Pylos, in the kingdom of wise old King Nestor, another hero of the Trojan War. Here, in 1996, in the basement of a regional museum, archaeologist Sharon Stocker finds boxes of burnt animal bones. Stored there by the famous archaeologist Carl Blagan more than 50 years ago and labeled table scraps, Stocker finds something peculiar about them. What we have represented here are bones from the thighs and the mandibles of bulls, male, cattle, and probably about 10 individuals are represented. The meat from 10 cattle can feed 6,000 people. And the fact that the remains are specific body parts, and all from male bulls, makes Stocker and archaeologist Jack Davis suspect they have something more than table scraps. It was here that he found the objects that we've been most interested in. 
Yes. That is, uh, in this corner, more or less, must have been the gigantic heap of animal bones. Clearly, the bones represent the animals eaten at the feast. A little bit closer to the wall in here had to be the spearhead. The spearhead is likely to be the butchering tool. And then I think off here must have been the, the pile of little, uh, of little kilikas, the miniature drinking cups. In Blagan's 1950s excavation, thousands of kilikis were discovered in every corner and corridor of Nestor's palace, representing thousands of guests drinking. All of these objects were grouped in close proximity here, one to another. But they also find one more piece of evidence, written in a primitive script known as Linear B. Translated in the 1950s, the tablet reveals another purpose for the feast. So it's about here that the tablet was found that uh, proves that sacrifices were in the process of being made in honor of the god Poseidon. Piecing together the evidence, Stocker and Davis paint a clear picture of feasting in the Bronze Age. Okay, so Sherry, if we were coming here to a feast, this must be where we get our first glimpse of the, uh, of the actual banqueting area. Then the guests, as Homer says, ate well, and no man's hunger lacked a share of the banquet. The young men brimmed the mixing bowls with wine, and poured rounds for all. And they would have seen the power of the king displayed there on the walls above them as they were participating in the feast, as a kind of reminder of what the Mycenaeans were capable of doing. Yes. By providing this feast and sacrifice, the king presents himself as the messenger to the gods and his call to war as divine destiny. Surely the feast in this setting is a persuasive weapon for a king luring warriors to join him in a battle against the Trojans. But as a final appeasement to the gods, King Agamemnon must make the ultimate sacrifice, the ritual murder of his own daughter. Helen, queen of Sparta, is abducted by Paris, prince of Troy. A personal attack on family honor escalates to an international crisis. With enticements of wealth and power, King Agamemnon forges an unwilling coalition of Mycenaean Greek warlords to do battle with the Trojans. But now, the gods and his warriors demand from him the ultimate sacrifice the ritual murder of his own daughter. This is the true story of Troy. At perhaps the most disturbing intersection of mythology and history lies the practice of human sacrifice. How can an act considered the ultimate sacrilege in the modern world be so prevalent to the ancients? Classics professor Robert Garland on a beach not unlike that of Troy. Human sacrifice is committed by Agamemnon. Achilles, we are told, slaughters 12 Trojan youths to appease the spirit of his friend Patroclus. And at the end of the war, Polyxena is sacrificed at the grave of Achilles. Although these incidents of human sacrifice exist in the mythological realm, there is also historical evidence of human sacrifice. From Egypt to Babylon, slave and prisoner sacrifice is widespread during the Bronze Age, often used as a public display of the king's power. But could the Greeks, founders of Western civilization, also have practiced human sacrifice? There seems to be some archaeological record of human sacrifice. I'm just going to mention 
certain chamber tombs here in the area of Mycenae where we have found um, bodies of slaves uh, one on top of the other. Uh, they were probably slaughtered uh, when their master died or prisoners of war and so on and so forth. To them, it was not probably human sacrifice. What we consider human sacrifice is not the same thing with what they consider human sacrifice. A slave or a prisoner of war is an object, is not a human being. Interestingly, although human sacrifice is prevalent in the mythology of Greece and the Trojan War, Homer never mentions it in the Iliad. It's a few hundred years after Homer when some of the greatest Greek playwrights incorporate human sacrifice into their stories of the Trojan War. One reason may have been as a storytelling device to entertain their audiences. It's often true that uh, forms of religious behavior that were once uh, sacrosanct and uh, received great uh, veneration later on become the subject for uh, horror and, uh, and a way of getting a, a, a chill, really, out of, uh, out of the audience. So in the story of the Trojan War, Agamemnon succeeds at assembling a coalition of Mycenaean warriors. But as they ready to set sail for Troy, the winds blow against them. The oracle tells Agamemnon, for favorable winds, he must sacrifice his daughter. Iphigenia. He did so by summoning her to Aulis on the pretext that she was going to be married to Achilles. Instead, he butchered her and, in so doing, set in train a terrible set of events that would end in his own death. To the Greeks, this was a powerful message, whether real or mythological. In war, a king asks his subjects to sacrifice the lives of their sons. Now the king, by offering his daughter, is making a similar sacrifice. The Greeks may see it as democratic and egalitarian. If not us, why not the king? And if not our sons, why not his daughter? To us. The idea of sacrificing uh, Iphigenia seems uh, horrific. But given the religion and mores of the time, the sacrifice of Iphigenia was a supreme expression of commitment on the part of Agamemnon. He was so committed to the success of this enterprise that he was willing to sacrifice his own daughter. That must have had an effect upon the psyche of his soldiers because they recognized how dedicated he was and how much he expected of them. Thus, the first blood spilled in the Trojan War is that of a child. Ultimately, Agamemnon will pay for her death with his life. But for now, a forceful wind blows the Greek war fleet east to Troy. What the Greeks didn't know is the resistance they were about to meet at the hands of man-killing Hector and his army of Trojans. To forge a coalition of Mycenaean warriors and satisfy the gods, Agamemnon makes the ultimate sacrifice, the ritual murder of his own daughter. In a thousand ships, the Greeks sail east to Troy with dreams of wealth and honor. But their overwhelming force is negated by the fierce Trojans and their powerful allies. They fight to a standstill for 10 long years. Now, powerful egos and dissension in the Greek ranks threatened to destroy the coalition from within. This is the true story of Troy. It is an epic clash of civilizations, a defining moment in prehistory to which, once again, Homer may be our best witness. In the 16,000 lines or so of Homer's Iliad, he explores all the major questions which 
we still grapple with as we make war today and consider the questions around warfare. The justification for a major military exercise. The accountability, the quality of military leadership. The nature of courage and cowardice on the battlefield. And indeed, what happens to victors and defeated alike in the face of day-to-day -day brutality. And yet, in his Iliad, Homer doesn't chronicle the entire 10 years of battle. He focuses on just four days of the war's 10th and final year. He brings us, I think, to the very heart of what human conflict is all about. Some of his most memorable descriptions are of men dying. The 240 deaths that occur in the Iliad, all are different. Homer must have seen action at first hand. He must surely have gone over the battlefield at Troy and tried in his own imagination to recreate how this battle took place. We see warfare from so many different angles and we see it up close and personal from Homer. Warriors face off on the battlefield, calling out names and insults. Soldiers thrust spears through enemy eyes, swinging swords, hacking off limbs. Homer says black blood stains the battlefield. His name defines this brutal age of warfare known as the heroic or Homeric era. This was very much an individual contest for personal glory. And there was uh, believed to be a glory in the nature of your opponents and in the extent of your success over them. It's a bit more tribal. The nature of your military reputation depends upon who you individually fight and how well you do against them. Homer describes many duels, but one he portrays as the ultimate duel, the one to end 10 years of war. Menelaus, the offended husband of Helen, is challenged by Paris, Helen's Trojan lover. If Paris kills Menelaus, Helen stays in Troy and the Greeks withdraw defeated. If Menelaus kills Paris, he reclaims Helen, takes a king's ransom of gold from Troy, and Greek honor is restored. The two armies sit down and the duel takes place. This is sanity, Homer is saying. This is how it should be. But it's not how it goes. Menelaus and Paris cross swords, risking life and honor to end a decade of conflict. Menelaus overpowers Paris, readies a death blow. Then Homer rescues Paris with a stroke of divine intervention. The goddess of love, Aphrodite, whisks Paris off the battlefield into the arms of Helen. The duel ends unfulfilled. The truce erupts in war. This war, in a certain sense, had to be. More forces had been unleashed than could now be contained. But at that short, brief moment of time, Homer seems to be saying, this is how conflict should be resolved between the only interested parties. Though ending a war with a duel between two leaders may be wishful fantasy, many of Homer's observations of battle are timelessly true. One of the underlying themes that you draw out of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, that remains relevant today in a military setting is that character matters. That theme remains with us. We still are very uh, concerned for the character of our officers and our soldiers. Modern armies can learn from the soldiers of the Trojan War. But the greatest of the Greek warriors, Achilles, might not last long in today's army. In front of other warlords, Achilles threatens and insults Agamemnon, his commanding officer. Get 
what a worthless, burnt-out coward I'd be called if I would submit to you and all your orders. Whatever you blurt out, fling them at others. Don't give me commands. Never again, I trust, will Achilles yield to you. To Homer's audience, Achilles' rage against Agamemnon reflects a conflicted hero defending his honor. But today, his insults would be court-martialed as insubordination. Achilles was preoccupied with his reputation uh, and his personal standing amongst the Greeks. The absolute opposite of a team player. Odysseus is, is, of course, a different uh, character, and, and again, he's yet another expression of the fact that character matters. Uh, he is wily. He's compared to a fox. Even today, we compare some of our most capable military figures to foxes. The Swamp Fox, Francis Marion of the American Revolution, and General Franks of the war in Iraq are among some with reputations of cunning like a fox. But Homer highlights another key quality of leadership by demonstrating the opposite. Never once did you arm with the troops and go to battle. You lacked the courage. King who devours his people. Unlike an ideal general like George Washington, who leads his troops by example, Agamemnon is accused of hanging out in the back while others fight and die. Agamemnon is arrogant, overweening, uh, very much given to advance his own personal agenda, uh, and inclined in the mind of others to take advantage of his position for his personal gain rather than to be a servant of the rest. Ironically, the soldier who is idealized by Homer is Hector, who fights for Troy. He has the character of the model soldier and citizen. Hector is more inclined to set the welfare of his people and his city above his own reputation and his own survival. And ultimately, uh, he faced down Achilles even though he knew that the odds were against him and that his time was up. The battle between the two greatest heroes, Greek Achilles and Trojan Hector, is the climax of the Iliad and Homer's story of Troy. When Hector takes leave of his wife and child on his way to battle, Homer foreshadows the end of the war and tilts the sympathies of his audience in favor of the Trojans. Hector envisages that Andromache will be a widow and that his son Astyanax will be an orphan. And like any true husband there, he says, I care for you more than I do for my countrymen. It's your fate that really matters to me. Homer portrays Hector as a family man. While the Greeks are fighting for revenge and greed, Hector is fighting to defend his wife, his child, and his home. The Trojans, in a sense, are us. And it is through their eyes, very largely, through the eyes of men like Hector, that we read the events that are going to be so shattering. Hector sees Achilles charging like a stallion. Achilles closes, helmet flashing, throws his spear and misses. Hector hurls his spear, striking Achilles' shield dead center and glances off. Hector draws his sword and charges, but Achilles has a second spear and drives it clean through Hector's neck. Hector falls to the dust and gasps, pleading with Achilles to return his dead body to Troy. But Achilles promises to feed his body to the dogs, lashes his corpse to his chariot, whips his horses to run around the walls of Troy, and as Homer says, defiles Hector's body in the land of his own fathers. And in the last great scene of Homer's poem, King Priam comes to beg for the mutilated body of Hector, his son. 
King Priam comes and he grasps the man-slaying hands of Achilles and like a suppliant he appeals to Achilles' compassion and Achilles yields and the two men collapse together in an acknowledgement of their human identity. They're no longer Greek and Trojan. They're no longer deadly enemies. Instead, they are like father and son. It is here where Homer reveals his subversive mission. He ends what is perhaps the world's greatest war story with an anti-war message. We are all human. We are all fathers and sons. We all have attachments that go way beyond our national identity. We are human beings, first and foremost. A truce is declared for the cremation of Hector's body. Funeral laments are sung. The flames from the fire consume his corpse, and looming are the walls of Troy. Homer does not elect for a Hollywood ending. He elects for an ending which reminds us that more slaughter is to follow. Homer is saying to us, his audience, in a way, you are not to be trusted. More havoc will surely follow. More brutality, more carnage, and ultimately, too, the destruction of Troy. Although this completes Homer's story, the true story of Troy does not end here. Suddenly, the Greeks are gone, and a wooden horse stands outside the gates of Troy. The greatest Trojan hero, Hector, is dead killed in battle by the Greek hero Achilles. After defiling Hector's body, Achilles agrees to surrender Hector's corpse to the Trojans. An uneasy truce is called as Hector is cremated before the walls of Troy. But when dawn breaks and the Trojans brace for another Greek attack, they discover their enemy is gone and a wooden horse stands outside the city gates. This is the true story of Troy. The most famous symbol of Troy, the Trojan horse, comes to us from legends other than Homer's Iliad. The legend tells us that this was a war that was not won by uncommon acts of valor, by steadfastness and military discipline, all the qualities that we might expect. On the contrary, it was won by a devastating ruse. It was won by deception, deceit, and conspiracy, and all the things that we might consider to be dishonorable in the conduct of warfare. Everyone knows the story. After 10 years of battle, the Greeks and Trojans fight to a standstill. Then Odysseus comes up with a plan. The Greeks build a giant wooden horse, leave it as an offering to the Trojans, and then sail away. Some Trojans are skeptical. Laocoon warns, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. But myth says he and his sons are silenced by serpents that drag them into the sea. The Trojans desperately want to believe that the horse is a peace offering and the Trojans broke their walls down to let the horse enter, stuffed full as it was with Greek soldiers. And in the night, as the Trojans were celebrating the departure of the Greeks, down came the Greeks out of the wooden horse, let in their companions, and proceeded to rape, pillage, and destroy. By hiding in the belly of the wooden horse and tricking the Trojans into lowering their guard, the Greeks finally penetrate the massive walls of Troy. All of Hector's fears, why he was willing to risk his life to defend his homeland, are about to become true. Priam was slaughtered at his own altar. Cassandra was raped. 
and the infant son of Hector was thrown from the walls of Troy, his brains dashed out. With Hector's mother and father hacked to pieces, his sister sacrificed, his son murdered, and his wife carried off to the bed of a conquering Greek. His family's seed is wiped from the earth forever. For the Greeks, this hard-earned victory means honor restored, the riches of Troy, and Helen. But although there is plenty of archaeological evidence of Troy being destroyed, how could the legend of the Trojan horse be true? The Trojan horse um, uh, has become something of a metaphor for, um, for trickery, you know, for being able to outwit your opponent for having something that is a, uh, so carefully contrived uh, of an artifice that you're uh, given an overwhelming advantage. The idea that the Greeks would have, in fact, built a large wooden horse hidden inside it and had it dragged inside of Troy is certainly possible, but it kind of strains your credulity a little bit that, that someone really could have pulled that off. My inclination is to see in the Trojan horse some kind of a representation, vaguely remembered of siege equipment, the weaponry that can be brought up against walls to either bring them down or to, to, to somehow neutralize them. Hittites and Assyrians possessed siege technology. It's possible this Bronze Age weapon of mass destruction could have inspired the legend of the Trojan horse. But whether history or myth, the Trojan horse came to symbolize a war won by trickery and deception. What the legend seems to be telling us is that even though this war was fought for a just cause of sorts, and even though in the end, right won in the sense that the Greeks were victories, nonetheless, that victory was at such cost that it put into question the whole validity of the war itself. Achilles meets his death, struck in his heel by an arrow from the bow of Paris. Odysseus is doomed to wander for another 10 long years before he gets home. Menelaus readies to kill Helen, his unfaithful wife, but when he sees her naked beauty, drops his sword. They too take 10 years to find their way back to Sparta. And as for Agamemnon, on his first night home in Mycenae, Clytemnestra, his queen, having never forgiven her husband for the sacrifice of their daughter, assassinates him in his victory bath. So the homecoming of the Greeks was, for them, as devastating as was the destruction of Troy. In fact, history tells us in the wake of the Trojan War, not only do the Mycenaean kingdoms collapse, but the entire Bronze Age comes to an end. There is much speculation as to its cause. Civil war, outside invaders, or a string of devastating earthquakes. Greece falls into a dark age for nearly the next 500 years, until the time of Homer. What survives through the Dark Ages is the story of Troy. If you contextualize this war and you see what comes after that, the decline, the catastrophes, the economic collapse, the Greeks never managed again for the next 400 years to come together as a nation. That was most probably the last glorious event before the disintegration, before the dissolution and the fragmentation of the Mycenaean world. And I think that's why it stayed in the memory. And as Homer sings stories of Troy, the rage of Achilles, the beauty of Helen, and the valor of Hector, his songs inspire the invention of the Greek alphabet. The Iliad and Odyssey become the foundation of Western literature, and Troy, is emblazoned forever into the history of the world.
The Iliad and the Odyssey had enormous impact in the Archaic period, the 7th, 6th, 5th centuries BC. And so, by extension, it's not surprising that people wanted to go to the site where that war was believed to have taken place. Then the residents realized that they need to market the city very aggressively, almost like a Disneyland of antiquity. The site of Troy rises from ruin to major tourist destination. Ancient burial mounds are turned into monuments to Greek and Trojan heroes. Temples and theaters are built to their gods. And maidens reenact scenes from the fall of Troy. They would sing sections of the Iliad and the Odyssey in the Agora, in the marketplace of the city, right in front of the old Bronze Age fortification walls. As the city is rebuilt, history and myth become one, and Troy becomes a war prize in a worldwide conflict. The Trojan War, among other things, resonates because from the perspective of many people in antiquity down to the present time, it was a conflict between East and West. In a way, it's the beginning of the combative stances of both sides, it's us against them. Now, the tourist destination of Troy attracts more than just tourists. First, Persian King Xerxes stops at the site in 480 BC on his way to sack Greece, claiming to avenge his Trojan ancestors. Then in 334 BC, Alexander the Great stops at Troy to pay homage to Achilles on his way to Persia. He goes to the temple of Athena, where he saw a range of armaments associated with the Trojan War. And he looked at the armor that was presented there, chose one set of armor to wear himself in his battle against the Persians. I like to think that it would be that of Achilles, although we don't know that for certain, and then goes off to, to fight the Persians wearing Trojan War armor. Alexander the Great conquers Persia, avenging Greece and reclaiming Troy as part of the Western world. Just as Alexander links himself to the Greek hero Achilles, Julius Caesar claims lineage to the Trojan hero Aeneas. And Rome adopts Troy as its mother city. But the Romans embrace more than a mythological connection to Troy. They also model their ideal soldier on that of Trojan hero Hector. The Romans would say uh, that the ideal soldier was discipline, uh, was a team player, uh, was willing to sacrifice himself for the welfare of others, uh, was willing to efface his personal glory for the, uh, the good of the whole. The military success of the Roman legions is a tribute to the legacy of the Trojans. Even though the Greeks originally defeat the Trojans, the Trojans are avenged when Rome battles Greece. It's ironic that the Trojan refugees led by Aeneas are purported to have been the ancestors of the Romans, and the Romans in turn conquered the Greeks. And so it's as if history came full circle. Uh, the Trojans were conquered and then became the conquerors. Troy and its stories are the oldest uninterrupted memories of our world. Troy is beauty, language, power, sacrifice, vanity, honor, deceit, and war. From literature to archaeology, history to mythology, Homer to Hollywood, we believe so strongly in Troy that the question of whether it is real or not hardly seems to matter. The search for the true story of Troy will live forever. There are always going to be surprises. You don't have to speak the language to be able to interact with people. Knowing that can make you look at history in a new and exciting way.